Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle and you can find my reviews, blogs, and original music at www.sonic-cinema.com. Thank you for checking out the podcast, whether you found it through the Sonic Cinema Podcast YouTube channel or podcast platforms such as Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or Amazon. Regardless of where you listen, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review, and share the podcast wherever possible. Also, be sure to check out the Sonic Cinema Patreon at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. Whether you're there to support me in general or listen to my series Life Soundtrack, get exclusive first listens to my music, or watch my series Leaving the Collection, among other content, it means a lot to me that you would support me financially. Again, that is patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. Earlier this week, I was to record a different podcast episode, but my guests had to reschedule for personal and important reasons. Uh, you will get that episode later in July, but I still wanted to record something. Um, that's kind of the genesis of this episode, which is one of the few that I'm writing out in its entirety prior to recording. I feel like the past year or so has seen the podcast take a turn in both quality and meaningfulness that is honestly quite profound to think about. There are two factors for that. Uh, the combinations of guests as well as the subject matter that we're talking about. Some of my favorite episodes in the nine-year history of the podcast have come in this past year. That's not a reflection of the episodes or guests that I had before, but um, because I will say I'm always profoundly grateful for every guest I've had on the podcast and for giving me their time and their opportunity to share their voice on the podcast. But in re-listening to many of the episodes from the past year and editing them for publication, I find myself thinking I'm in the middle of probably the best run of sharing my thoughts on film I've ever been on. Before I continue, I want to thank every person I've had on the podcast or occasional live stream to date. Whether it's friends like Ronnie Haynes, David Miles, Heather L., Daniel Green, Jeffrey Butzer, Stuart Delaney, Matthew and Bailey Timms, Jay Barber, and Marv Dickey. Whether it's filmmakers like Prince and Holt, Brian Ackley, David Spaltro, Timothy J. Cock, Chris Esper, Cindy Maples, Jacob Belinsky, the team over Film Valor, Christopher D'Annunzio, Nicholas Duarte, Christopher Maloney, Matthew Saliba, the team over No Restrictions, Jeffrey and Eric Leiser, Jeremiah Kipp, Liz Manischel, Chad Meisenheimer, Russ Camarda, Nathan Suher, K11, Grace Aki, Christian Taftrup, Nathan Halpern, Phil Hopkins, Ash Pantino, and Aaron Everhart, Jeff Marslett, and every filmmaker who's given me their time at a film festival or during a press day. I'd also like to thank fellow critics and podcasters like Phil Faso, Kevin Thomas, Colby Mack, Amy Smith, Patrick Michael, Jason from Binge Movies, Scott Phillips, Darren Lundberg, Robert Yanis Jr., Rosa Perra, Kip Mooney, Morgan Roberts, Carlo from the Movie Loot, Chelsea Eicholtz, Amanda Spears, Daniel Stoltzman, David Rosen, Charya Chawa, Dr. Becky O'Brien, Scott Weinberg, Simon Watson, and Matthew St. Clair. Finally, I want to thank my mother, Vicki Scuttle, whom you heard earlier this year in an episode that, like I said at the time, I wasn't sure how I felt about at the time, but in part because of where she is in her life has really become something greatly personal to me and really a favor of mine. Uh, you will definitely hear from many of these people again in the in the podcast, and I hope some new voices along the way. The reason all of these people have been included on the podcast is not only did I want to hear their thoughts on the films and topics at hand, but I wanted to share their voices with my listeners. In return, many of the critics and podcasters listed, as well as a few not listed, 
has had me on their podcasts, and I am very blessed to have met some great people along the way, and I look forward to meeting more. The only reason to record a podcast about a subject or interview a filmmaker is that you want to share your feelings about that subject and filmmaker with your listeners. We've discussed individual films, we've discussed filmmakers, genres, awards, film festivals, as well as even the pre preservation of cinema. All of these discussions have had great value to me, and even if there are occasionally things that I wish I had done differently in the moment or brought up differently in the moment, they're all important in how I've grown as a critic and podcaster. I have a lot more that I want to share with the world as a critic, as a podcaster, as a composer, and as an individual. I have a book to release to the public. I have original music to compose and release. And I have more film festivals I want to attend. I also have a list of films I very much want to discuss in podcast form. Some of those are already in the works. Others are just waiting for the right moment. Um, this, this podcast, the way this podcast is sounding, might seem like the words of somebody who doesn't have much time left and is basically wanting to take stock in what they've accomplished so far, but I do assure you I'm in as good a health as a 45-year-old asthmatic with diabetes can be. I'm just at the point in my life where I want to put out more positivity out into the world rather than cynicism. And I want everybody from my subscribers, listeners, readers, to the people who have shared their time with me on the podcast to know how much I value them. And I do value every single one of them uh, for what they've given me over the years in my exploration of film. We are halfway into the ninth year the podcast has been recorded, and in lieu of the original episode I had planned for this slot, this felt like a good time to share my thoughts on the podcast and what I feel like I'm doing with it, or at least trying to do with it. The past few years have been filled with some profound changes in my life, and Sonic Cinema has come to mean more in my life than ever before as a way of keeping me centered, apart from my wife and mother and close friends and family, few other things in my life are as important to me. So I want to close this episode with um, my thoughts on some movies that have meant the most to me in seeing them over the past few years. A couple were ones that I've seen recently that I are among my favorites from 2023. 20, Some are classic film discoveries that I've made over the past few years. One is a rewatch that had a great deal to me. And the other ones are films from the past three or four years that I've really had a, had a profound impact on me when I watched them and dug deep into my soul and challenged me to consider life in cinema on a different level. We are going to uh, start with the films from 2023 that have really connected with me and are some of my favorites, and they're both foreign films. The first one is the South Korean action film, The Child, which follows a son who is trying to raise money so his mother can have a life-saving surgery, and he gets entangled in a business situation for somebody who is supposedly his father. And the way this movie takes turns, the way the movie builds off of character as opposed to spectacle, but the spectacle was really quite spectacular, is one of the reasons that I really loved it. Very much felt like an 80s or 90s action movie, but felt very new, and the dynamics between some of the main characters uh, Marco has meets is really fascinating, and I just really enjoyed this movie. It was a t 
ton of fun to watch, and I'm looking forward to watching it again. I very much uh, hope to, when when it does come out, hope to add to my collection, and um, I, I really just enjoyed this uh, film. The next one is Pietro Marcello's uh, Scarlet. His previous film was an adaptation of Martin Eden, but Scarlet honestly connected with me more. It is the story of a father and daughter after World War I, and the father struggling to give his uh, daughter the life that he feels like she deserves. And there's something very lovely and romantic about this movie. It feels like a fable. And I think a big part of that is the score by Gabrielle Yared, which I absolutely love, and it's probably my favorite score of the year so far. And there's a beautiful visual sheen on this film that really connects with you, and there's also just a lovely simplicity to the story. And I, I think that's one of the things that I really loved about Scarlet and the Child. There's the simplicity to both stories that I really uh, appreciate how they went about their business. And if you get a chance to watch either one, I cannot recommend them enough. It is a, they're both really lovely films, and they're some of my favorite films that I've seen this year, and will probably stay that way. So going back to the older movies, uh, we're going to start with a rewatch that I had a few years ago that had a really profound impact on me, and that is uh, John Frankenheimer's second. I'm going to be talking more about this movie in a future episode, but I do want to say I watched this movie in 1996 for the first time, my freshman year of college, and I liked it. I, I thought it had a really fascinating style, visual look, but the story kind of didn't really grab me the way I wanted it to, but I still thought it was a good movie. Bought on the Criterion Chant Collection. Um, watched it a few years ago, shortly after theaters closed, and it's a very different experience as a 42-year-old man than as a 19-year-old uh, student. And I will expound on why when we talk about it on the podcast, that is going to be something that comes up very soon. But I, I think it's, it's, it's something that really points to the importance of rewatches because uh, something like that just lands with you a bit differently when you're older than when you're younger, saying things that you won't necessarily understand until you're older. Next up is Umberto D. Vittorio De Sica's neorealist film. I talked about this with Phil Faso when we discussed Italian neorealism. Uh, I thought I'd seen it before, but it had been a while, so last year was really kind of a first watch for me, and sort of like seconds, it's something that I think you you have a better appreciation for when you're older and you've gone through life and you've had some struggles in life. And I think Umberto D is just really a beautiful testament to how, not only how difficult life can be, but also finding a way to persevere through life and it it really this one this one had an impact on me when I watched it last year and I I thought it was quite beautiful next up is Robert Altman's McCabe and Mrs. Miller a uh, terrific western beautiful cinematography by Altman a uh, really fascinating character piece with Warren Beatty and uh, Julie Christie and I, this, this is a movie that really landed with me the first time I saw it a few years ago. And I'm 
I'm looking forward to rewatching it over the years. It's probably one of my favorite westerns that I've ever seen. Next up is Sam Peckinpah's Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, which is a very slow motion action movie, very violent, very rough and tumble. I watched it earlier this year for repertory reviews, and it was one that just had me completely. I I love this movie, and I again it I you can see the way Peck and Paw is playing with the action genre as it was at the time and pulling forward to some of what would become. Next up is William Freakin' Sorcerer, which I saw a couple of years ago on my birthday. And Freakin's film, from the images, from the absolutely uh, desperate story that it's telling, and of course the Tangerine Dream soundtrack, just had me from minute one and did not let me go. And it's become a great favorite of mine, and I loved watching it over the plaza last year. Next year, next up, we're going to get into the modern films that have really had an impact on me, starting with Terrence Malick's A Hidden Life, about a conscientious objector of the Nazis in World War II, and what his decision means for his family. Uh, this one what came along at a time where I was really struggling with how to handle my mother as her dementia was getting really bad, and it just completely flattened me and really gave me a sense of hope that the decisions I was making were ultimately the right ones, and trying to move forward with them was important. And it's not only my favorite Terrence Malick film, it's probably one of my favorite films of all time. Next up is K-11's Black Lake, which I, I've seen several times now. And it is a film about trauma. It's a film about, about transforming after being connected to trauma and uh, having that shared connection with other people because of trauma. And uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing vision, even in, in the directorial cut form that I saw at Renegade this year or as part of Renegade this year. It is something that just completely blows me away. And uh, it's one of my favorite soundscapes of the 2020s so far. Uh, and Black Lake, when it is made available to the public, I cannot recommend it enough. Next up is Ku 53, which is a documentary that unfortunately is not really available because of legal reasons. But it is the story of a uh, of an Iranian filmmaker trying to make trying to tell the story of how Britain's role in the uh, coup of the democratically elected leader in Iraq uh, happened from the British side. He was he the filmmaker is a native Iranian, but he was sent to Britain as a teenager, and you can really feel the tension he has and the sense of trying to reconcile both sides of that in the documentaries. He's trying to put the pieces together with uh, editor Walter Mersch. And it's a fascinating documentary. If you get a chance to watch it, I cannot recommend it enough. Next up is another documentary from 2020. It's one that I saw at the Atlanta Film Festival this year. Don't even know if it's available, but I really loved it. Um, it is uh, Cinema Premiere, and it's the story of a movie theater operating in Afghanistan in the uh, years after the 
after the Taliban fell in 2001 after September 11. And, you know, as somebody who, in it, you know, watching it at the time during uh, COVID was fascinating because of the fact that, you know, that was a time where movie theaters were really struggling and seeing their struggle was certainly is not the same thing between, you know, COVID versus the war on terror, but seeing the struggles that they had when it came to running a movie theater and uh, coming up against the film censors was fascinating. And I really, really love this movie. I hope it becomes available because I, I really kind of loved it. Finally, there's uh, Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, which is very much, after three viewings, is very much one of my favorite movies of his. And Sammy Fableman's story very much feels like my story in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously, the narrative, uh, the narrative ideas are different in each one, but it's something where... Uh, I, I've felt those feelings that Sammy Fableman goes through and the way Spielberg films that movie, that deeply personal movie of his, the way John Williams scores it. I, I come back to it. it it's going to be one of my, probably one of my very favorite movies of all time by the time I'm done here. And, and I, I cannot thank him enough for that film. As always, thank you for listening to the Sonic Cinema podcast. Uh, we will be back in later in the month with an episode about one of the great film composers of all time, as well as the original episode that was in place this week, which is going to be about a trilogy of thrillers from one of the great unheralded masters of 20th century cinema. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and I hope you continue to enjoy uh, the podcast and continue to follow my work at www.sonic-cinema.com. <laughs>